Good evening and welcome to Ballina Fringe Festival's online presentation for this evening, Waking the Dead, Kevin Toulis in conversation with David McGowan. Kevin Toulis is an author, filmmaker and bardic poet. His book, My Father's Wake, explores the way Irish people deal with death and grieving. His new book, Nine Rules to Conquer Death, is available to buy tomorrow. David McGowan has been an undertaker for over 40 years. Recently, he was the subject of a documentary film entitled The Funeral Director, directed by Gillian Marsh and aired on RTE to great reviews. We hope you enjoy. So, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm here with the finest of men, David McGowan. I suppose, uh, and we both have a mutual interest in death. Um, I suppose the first question I'd like to ask David is, what would you see is the difference between the Irish way of death and let's say the English way of death, or I'd call it like the Western, the much bigger, I suppose more um, industrial process you get in America. Attitudes to death really, as they differ between Ireland and other countries. Yeah, well I suppose we were, we were renowned for doing death very well. And that would be mostly, it's our culture that's mostly responsible for the way we carry out ourselves in that matter, you know. And uh, we'd be the envy of a lot of countries because of the way we do death. Um, England, it's only across the pond, but it's a completely different attitude toward death than the dying and the rituals and their cultures. Uh, from my experience, for instance, if somebody passes away, and I like using the word passing away because I don't like use of death because I don't believe we die, I believe we pass on. Mm -hmm. uh, People that pass on um, in Ireland, normally the families will be constantly ringing us during the day. When we can we have a mother? When can we have a father? They don't talk about expense. They don't talk about uh, anything else other than get possession of their loved one. In the UK, I worked a while beyond with them, and I was studying the culture and their relation to death and dying. Seeing the body wasn't as important as um, waiting for somebody to come for two weeks for the funeral. You know, mm. seeing the body didn't seem to be an issue with them. And if they never seen it, it wouldn't worry. And a lot of times they would just arrange the time for the mass, the time for the cremation, and they'd all meet at that spot, have the service, and then the committal after. How, how useful do you think it is seeing the actual we call it the remains, but seeing the physicality of the dead. Oh, from a psychological point of view, I think it's it's very important in in the healing process going forward. I notice from families that didn't get the opportunity to see the parents struggled greatly with coming to terms of the loss. Now you have to remember that I spent my forty years among people that are going through the worst uh, life experience any human being will ever experience, and that's the losing of a loved one. Mm -hmm. And people grieve in different ways. And as a funeral director, I have to be sensitive to those needs. And I see people that haven't had an opportunity to see their loved ones laid out in a nice, comfortable, environment and situation, that they struggle down the road later with the whole grieving process. Mm. Um, I find it's very therapeutic for a grieving family to be able to walk in, see the body, because seeing is believing, it brings closure. You can argue with them, you can touch them, you can kiss them, you can talk to them. And a lot of times in, when I'm in a wake house and the family are saying to me, we laid the person out here. And I'd say, wait a minute now, where's the kitchen? It's there, right, so this is where all the entertainment is going on. What about when you have your quiet 10 minutes that you want to shut away from your friends and you just a thought has come into your head and you want to leave that area? Could we get a little room that you could go pull the door, shut off everything and have your 10 minutes there? It's private time, it's therapeutic. And most families have done that and they've come back to me and said, you know, that was the best 10 minutes. Yeah. So seeing, touching, Kissing, to me, is very valuable for a family going forward into the grieving process. So that's why it's important, I think, yeah. that 
uh, people should get to see their loved ones. You see, one of the things I write about in Nine Rules to Conquer Death is how important that moment is. Mm. Because the dead are everything and nothing like us. I mean, if you've never seen a dead body before, or it's like your, if you see your first corpse, I mean, one of the most interesting things is um, they're awfully quiet. You can touch them, brush their hair, beat your fists on, on their chest, tell them that you love them, tell them that you hate them, and of course they don't react. And I, re I remember the shock of my own, seeing my own dead brother. Because like every human being that you've ever met before is a warm mammal. And when obviously you touch the dead, the, the great shock about touching the dead is how cold they are. And again, the other thing is, it's, I think it's such an important point in human history because in that difference between the living and the dead is the foundation of all religion, the, found the search for eternal life. We look, I don't know in your own experience, but we look at the dead and we sort of are flummoxed by how, of course, they are a perfect facsimile of the person that we love, but actually so utterly different because the, the great kind of animating current of personality has disappeared. So there's this, I think there's this great existential shock that they are or are not there, the, the, the them who they were. And I always f find that phrase, you know, I'd like to remember them as, the who, as who they truly were. They are this, they, are, they were embodied in this body. That, you know, that there's nowhere else where that person ever lived, but it's part of that kind of transition. And I think the other thing, um, if you've not seen dead bodies, is, you know, human beings, as everyone's watching tonight, um, your blood is pumping around your body at two pounds per square inch of pressure. But obviously when that pump stops, you know, the blood drains away. I mean, that's your, your profession, is, is to bring back, would you call it bring back the semblance of that which was lost because the blood drains away to the lower limbs, um, you know, your, your cheeks sag. I remember my first week when I was seven, you know, the ivory yellow color of a bloodless finger, uh, the stillness. And my, my mother took me to awake when I was seven in, in her village, Valnesoli in Ackle, lifted me up into the coffin. And even then I knew that, <laughs> I knew that person was dead because they were too still. They were too still to be pretending. And then I remember what she said to me. She said, um, touch them. It will make you less afraid. Lift me up. I touched them. She said, you know, see the sign of the cross. And I remember these old ladies looking over at me, thinking, you know, the prayers of this child would go straight to heaven to help his soul. And then down on the floor and then over and then talking, gabbing away and me getting really bored and all that and get irritable and someone bringing me a biscuit. But how, you know, in your experience, of that difference of see you see it all the time but for other people even irish people it's the shock of their seeing their loved one what's you know what's the kind of difference or your memories of with our culture here in ireland and it'd be different in every different country but the sh the the, 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 the may everybody grieves differently and i wouldn't like to force my opinion on anybody here because people listening to this might have gone through a different experience of what you just said my but overall, I've never seen, as, I, haven't, I can't say, I've seen more joy of the family seeing the body than of shock. Mm. Because as soon as cessation of life occurs, it's a big loss, as I just explained. And it sends shockwaves around your system at the, at the announcement of the death. You spend a period of time then, hours, waiting to see that person. And that's why it's important that the family do get to see and get to touch and sort of answering your first question again. Mm. And that's why I built a funeral home in, in, in Ireland and it was a copy of one I worked in in the States. So it was more like a mini hotel than anything because I believe nothing could be better for the deceased person to be laid out. Of. But I still like the concept of bringing somebody home. Because mm -hmm. that was their home, that's where they are, that's where they talk, that's where they had their 
good times, there are bad times and everything. And if you look around the walls of any house, you can get an insight into who that person is because you'll see them they're into horses, they'll be pictures and into that. And I like that whole thing, but it's also very softening and very it's very comforting for that family that's going through the biggest loss of any human being ever take them home. Mm. And it's not I don't see shock in an awful lot of cases. Yeah. Um, it all depends as well on, on the mode of the death, you know, whether it was untimely, sudden, traumatic, you know, we see there's a whole lot and sometimes it's not possible to get the person looking as 100% as they were, it all depends on that. But you try your best to get it, but yeah. you know in the back of your mind that it's going to be a comfort for the family that's going through the biggest loss that any human being will ever know, to take them home and they can see them dressed in their own clothes. Now I find, when I used to travel over and back to England when I was studying in Birmingham and all sorts of stuff, and the people in England would be uh, curious as to why we would bury somebody within four days. As one fellow said to me, bedside to graveside, and, Ireland is four days. Mm -hmm. So there was a time put on it. So I never thought about it like that. It's two weeks here. Yeah. So they, moved, they couldn't understand why we would want to get rid of them as quick. I, would, I felt like telling them when I was in Spain to bury them within 24 hours. But you see, don't you think, I, I think that's really important because it's the way that people have always buried their dead for hundreds of generations. I mean, I look to the wake and you can see you can see the roots of the wake even in the Iliad, written by Homer in 750 BC. Mm. The very last line of the, of the Iliad in ancient Greek is hos hoigam ipan tapan hectoros hepodamoio, which is thus held a wake and funeral for Hector, tamer of horses. And the last lines are a very classic description of an Irish wake. They have keeners, minstrels of the dirge, mm. they have feasting, everyone's gathered together. The women say eulogies over the dead Hector, and then they kind of bury him. They cremate him, and then they, and then they um, well, they burn him, and then they uh, yeah, they cremate him, and then they, they bury the remains. So I just think it's such a powerful thing in human culture. It's there for a reason, so that we can openly express our grief. I know, remember with my own father, Sonny, with him dying in Ackle, we didn't have sort of formal keening, but I'm sure you must have encountered it. Every time a close relative came in, the women kind of burst out keening. There was a wave of emotion that ran through the room. I cried too. And it's very sort of cathartic. And that's the problem I have really with the English way of death is somebody you love, maybe the most important person in your life, dies. They disappear. And then, you know, four weeks later, you have some ceremony in the South London crematorium when you've managed to you get fitted into the slot. And you can't, you can't gather around for a week, for a month. Your family can't give up their jobs. The burst, the, the, the concentration of support, uh, the bonding of a community event is, is just lost when the, between the death and the actual the interment or burial is so extended. Surely that's the strength of the Irish way of death, that it happens in a concentrated time frame, a beginning and an end. And, then you go on and go on with the rest of your life if you're maybe not so much for the close bereaved, but for the community. Yeah. <coughs> but to try and get some sort of handle on where it came from, some people say it's just biblical, it come from the Last Supper and all of that sort of stuff. And, um, the but I think it's a bit, uh, it is a bit older than that. Yeah. It's definitely in, yeah. even in Jeremiah. Yeah, but if you, if you take, if you go back to we'll say a hundred years ago on this island, you know, when it was probably, it, it was possible to die of hunger mm. on this island. I know a lot of young people out there find that hard to believe, yeah. but it was. And out of that came what we refer to as the mehel. To any Irish person, the word mehel will mean a group of people coming together mm. and helping each other at an, in a time of need. Yeah. Now. During the famine, it was possible to die on this island from hunger. 
how they survived, or some of them survived, in this part of the west of Ireland, I'm sure it has happened in rural Ireland. But you might have good platers, the man next door might have good turners, and what they did was they swapped with each other. When your turf was to be cut, we went out and cut your turf this week, we cut the next man the next week. When the hay was to be harvested, we do yours this week, we do his this sure. thing. Now, there was no money exchanged. People came together and helped each other out. Yeah. Now, that's how a lot of them survived. There was no money exchanged. The players were going, they shared the food, but they came together. We did the same on my grandfather's hay, David. Yeah. <laughs> now, a lot of that has gone, but yeah. would you believe it, in rural Ireland, the mehel still exists in mm. relation to that. When I take a coffin back to a house in rural Ireland and in a lot of places, um, as I leave that house, I met with the neighbours approaching the house with trays of sandwiches. Mm. That's still alive. I was discussing with people out of the door, men actually discussing about digging the grave. Now that doesn't happen in sure. any other country. Yeah. And it stems back from that time. Yeah. Now, there was a bit of a skiff made about the wake in, in Ireland for years and years. Oh sure, it's a great an excuse to drink, it's an excuse to party. Those people didn't that were saying that, they didn't understand the, our culture. Yes, there was there was drink and there was food and there was storytelling and the other. But again, it goes back to the time in this island where there was no radios, discos, pubs or restaurants. But they had what they call rambling houses. And what they happened was people rambled the roads. And I'd meet you on the road and they'd say, Mickey Tom is below in the house playing the fiddle. He's on top for him tonight. I said, yeah, I just left O'Neill's and the accordion player is yeah. a player. And they went and moved into each other's houses and then they carried the news of the parish from one house to another. Sure. So when a citizen of that parish died, passed on, Johnny Doe would be called to the wake to play the Bucks of Orden Moor on the accordion because the man in the coffin used to love to hear him yeah. playing the coffin. Sure. And as soon as he take out that accordion and played the first six notes, the toughest men, grown men in that house, would start crying yeah. because they knew the man in the coffin loved that tune and loved that man wouldn't and then the next thing the tears came. Wouldn't you see a wake, I mean I would see a wake as a transcendental mehel because just as you carry the coffin, I remember carrying the coffin of my father mm. or carrying coffins of colleagues sometimes even in the north, mm. a journalist colleague was murdered, but just as you carry that coffin today then in the future you know that somebody, hopefully in my case, yet unborn, will be carrying my coffin that you are giving in this moment, as you say, not for, not for any money, mm. but for a kind of communal reward, mm. that as you do today, hopefully your brothers and sisters will do for you in the future. And I'm very conscious of that when we're, we're carrying, um, I was carrying a family relative, mm. and uh, one tip, it was the apparition at Knock. <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I was with guys who'd obviously done it a lot more than me. And... Uh, and we were carrying it. They said, so you carry in, in up to the aisle, Kevin, and we'll get another cousin to carry them out. And, uh, and I just thought, when I took the weight, I thought, my God, thank God for, I'm only doing it once because that apparition at Knock was very, very heavy one. But deep within that is a sort of like a connection and a bonding as a community. And one of the things I think is so important about the wake too, and about open funereal rites, is that you're bringing in another generation, that you're teaching, not just about the one dead person, you're teaching the new generation, really one of the oldest and most eternal lessons, how to die. And by how to die, I mean how, to, how people die, what they look like when they die, how people react around death. Sometimes people are very upset, but it's okay that death is a normal part of life. And it's only by having an open ceremony the, what, what should we do, or some sort of experiment in school? No, you have a real funeral, a real coffin, a real dead person. And that is the way to educate the younger generation about this is what happens in life, that we're all mortal, it's going to happen to you, it happens in your community. This is a perfectly ordinary event. I don't know what you think about that idea, that it's not just even about the immediate family, it has this wider communal significance in terms of education, um, exposure to um, death, mortality, something that affects us all. Yeah, but I would see it from listening to people constantly carrying coffins, 
I would put it down to it's an honour to carry a coffin. Absolutely. Today yeah. I got a list from my family, 30 names on it. Make sure Tommy Joe's under that coffin. Right. They always went to the shop together. Yeah. He deserves to carry your coffin. Right. Okay, fine. Down it always is. Have there ever been any feuds? <laughs> People been denied. Yeah, I have heard a few, yeah. He's not getting under that coffin. You he see, that would be so strange in England. That would be so strange in yeah, England. I People would be just amazed. Yeah, what do you I mean? Yeah, I found it hard to, for them to understand. But then when, when, you, when you explain our culture to them mm. and our traditions and our rituals that are so apart. I was over in America a couple of years ago giving a talk to the New Jersey Funeral Directors Association. So I was speaking to 1,200 funeral directors and I was trying to explain to them what the mehel was. And I knew they weren't getting it because there was no reaction from the audience. Like, they were like, why would they dig a grave? Like, why, would they, why would you want to carry a coffin? And they were very silent. And I said, OK, a mehel. So I had to think quick because I lived in the States for a while. So I kind of knew a little bit about the word thing. So I knew, I just mentioned one word and the next thing I seen all the heads pop. I said, carpool, care Mm. which is yeah. big in America. You yeah. bring the kids, I'll collect them with my child. And they got it immediately. Yeah. But when I tried to tell them about all the traditions that's within our, yes, and all our people that left this island to seek employment and to seek a better life, they brought those rich traditions that you just spoke about with them. I met a man in New York, a builder, that's still putting a holy middle into every foundation of a house he built. Right. And then they couldn't a little bit understand. So again, like the explaining the mehel, I had to come up with a comparison for them in relation to people come our traditions. And I thought of the one that they celebrate even to this day, and they didn't even know anything about it. And the 22 million people that went to the States through Ellis Island and whatever, those people would have bought traditions with them. When they arrived into New York, um, there was a certain time of the year in this country where women and children would go around the houses and knock on the door and offer to pray or sing in return for food or money. And to remind people of that time of the year, they would get a turnip and they'd scoop out the centre of it and they'd cut two holes in it and they'd cut it and they'd put a candle in it. And they'd place it around the ditches around rural Ireland just to remind people there would be people calling to your house. Mm. Those people that arrived in New York, they would have brought that tradition with them. I suppose turnips often is readily available to them in New York as they were in rural Ireland. So they looked at the next closest thing, and that was the pumpkin. So yeah. they turned around, and it amazes to me that tradition is still celebrated today in the States. And the other surprising thing I noticed was it's celebrated by all other ethnic groups. Yeah. And it was the Irish that brought that. That's how, how do you think death is changing? Or, you know, like in England, death is very sort of professionalised. People don't really believe that they have control of their loved ones. You know, if you die in hospital, you have to obviously go through an undertaker. People feel that, that in a sense, it's beyond their control. And I just wonder how you, over your course of your career, you know, like with my own father, when he died, he died at home. He was washed by my aunt and one of my sister's um, he was moved into the, you know, was an undertaker. Uh, he's moved into the kit, in, into the sitting room. We took him to church, and then we buried him. And that really was, you know, that was pr a pretty old way of dying. But obviously, as we move in a much more modern way, I mean, how do you think that affects? Has it changed in your, obviously, in your career? How does it change the perception of death? In that people may may not, obviously, that's fairly unusual now, or is it? Do tell me, David. The only change, Kevin, I've seen is in the last eight months, and we all know what that's due, yeah. due to, which is what we're experiencing, this pandemic we're experiencing. I hate you bringing it up, because every time you turn on the television or radio today, it's nothing but it. But we've seen smaller funerals. Mm. We've seen no crowds coming. Yeah. Families are missing that hug and the kiss and the shake hands. Yeah. Um, but people are standing out on the roadside. Yeah. Now, this last long nine months, we've been carrying out funerals, not in the traditional way we're used to doing it, but we're still trying to give them as much as we possibly can. Yeah. 
you know, the people are coming out. We do put the time of leaving the house, go to church, and you'll see the community coming out, standing on the side of the road, and they just wave and stuff like that. I do believe, from talking to families, that they're missing that hug. Mm. They're missing that shake hands. Yeah. They're doing with that because they know every other country in the world has to do the same. Yeah. So they're accepting it. But they do miss it. Yeah. Now, I have to give credit to the churches in, in the areas and the bishops in my area and the priests and the clergy people because they didn't go all out and ban, ban funeral masses. Mm. Right. Now, you can, you know, you can postpone a wedding, you can postpone a communion, you can postpone this, but you can't postpone death. Yeah. And I'm glad that they continue to do that. That didn't happen in other parts of the country. Yeah. And people are suffering with that, with the whole grieving process because sure. now one bishop said to me, this issue of can cancellation is just a postponement. I said to him, you can't postpone death. Sure. Then he said, we'll have a memorial mass. Yeah. But I said, that's all very good. But we'll all know at that memorial mass there's something missing. Yeah. You need that. And thankfully in this region, that they, they took they made the decision and it wouldn't have been easy for them because a lot of the clergy would be elderly and stuff like that and they would have to be quarantined and you know but in fairness they came out and the people needed the support and it just goes to show to answer, try and answer the question where people need a funeral yeah i think one of the, the other really important things um again in, in having that community around you and in particular I, I, ireland where People are under a moral obligation to shake your hand, to acknowledge the death. It's not just, they're not just sort of waving. You know, they might be waving now, but actually coming up and shaking your hand. I remember and I was at my aunt's. It's not just a shake hand, it does a little squeeze. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I was at my aunt's um, funeral, and I was just, it was in a kind of um, community centre, and it was close to the coffin. So it was like a principal mourner. <laughs> and, you know, the 400 handshakes that you get, and how people have got slithery and, 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 <laughs> and hard and some man will kind of practically break your finger. Um, but also at the same time, which is really, I think, psychologically important, is they're saying they're dead. You know, they're, sorry for your trouble, but really they're putting this message. Life has changed, life has changed, life has changed. And even afterwards, like maybe two months later on, the first time you see somebody, this obligation that you're under to actually in the supermarket, now that's really important, I think, as a grieving process, because you are in your community. You've, your, your community is acknowledging that things have changed for you, that your behaviour might be, you know, might be a little bit um, wobbly in bits, but that life has changed, that and the person that you've lost is significant, significant enough for them to actually sort of come up. And you contrast that, I think, with the silence of grief in England, where there's no public grieving, there's no expression of it, you're expected to sort of, you know, go to work on the next Tuesday. And your colleagues would be kind of afraid of um, saying something because they might upset you. And, and sad is bad. One of my favourite lines from the Iliad is, um, it's called The Pleasures of Sorrow. And, uh, and this, it's Achilles' mother. And basically, she's, she's, he's lost his lover, Patroclus. And she sort of says, well, you need to have kind of more sex as a form of <laughs> grief therapy. Um, but also, he, he gets his men to ride round the, the body of his, his lover, Patroclus. And he says, until we have our fill of the pleasures of sorrow. And it's this sort of catharsis. So, again, it's, it's one of these, these rituals throughout our, the history of our species. We've lost people in our community. We've lost people we love. How do we mark that in our community? How do I mark you saying... I ex something significant has happened in your life. I understand you've lost your father, you've lost your wife, you've lost your daughter. I'm acknowledging it in public. And so I think that, again, that's one of the great strengths of having an open funereal rite, like a wake, a community gathered around you. Obviously, it's adapted during COVID times, but you c contrast that with a kind of English funeral where there's 40 people, they're all the same age, they're all usually retired, it's a tiny little ceremonial. You know, you go back to the golf club afterwards, or we did, you know, for a couple of drinks, and that's it over. And then your life is just supposed to go on, even though you might have lost your partner of 40 years, your spouse, and your life will be forever changed. 
I don't know how you, if you've, you've, because you've worked in America as well, haven't you? And mm. have you worked in England? Have yeah. You, yeah. So how would you see the, the different... I went on tour. Oh. I took a big interest in how cultures and traditions and rituals, because we were so rich. I went, I went off into the rising sun, trying right. to figure out how all, every other cultures. Yeah. And the one I found closest to us was Lithuania. Okay. And it was the one country that I've worked in that the people were so poor, I couldn't imagine. You know, I've never seen, you know, they were cutting their lawns with a side. Right. Uh, you, they put me up in, because what happened was, I went out to teach them how to do in ban. Okay. Right, how to look after their day. Because they have keener still. They mm. have the women are employed. The women sit one side of the coffin, the males sit the oh, other right. side. Yeah. And they have the black shawls. and They sit around that coffin. I love keening. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, but it has a very therapeutic thing as well. Like, Surely. Because, yeah. But, and it's their part in that. But there were amazing people. They were the poorest people ever I worked in my life, but they were the happiest. Mm. That's what I got out of it. Yeah. And it was in 2005. It was in the middle of the boom here. And I remember arriving down and, you know, these people brought me <coughs> out to their houses for lunch because they couldn't afford the hotel. Yeah. Right. And what was in the middle of the table? A big ponder of potatoes. But inside the potatoes was bits of meat stuck in them. Mm. They had their own alcohol brew, like moonshine, and yeah. that was distributed. And I said to myself, this is like turning back the clock on, in our time, you know. Yeah. But they were the happiest people. They all had smiles on their faces. Yeah. Tell me about Keenan, you see, because one of the, my life goals, mm. when I'm not writing books and talking here in Ballina, I, I'm part of a band called The Wonders of the Wake. Right. And we did the last live gig in Ireland mm. at the Lyric Theatre in Belfast on March the 15th. And we had, bringing back Keenan, we had Fela Women's Community Choir. We had 50 women, Keenan. Uh, and we, we composed some music. And, and um, so... The idea, see, the idea was to really bring back the kind of power of that collective um, emotion. I mean, Keening is the oldest uh, music of womankind. It's mentioned again in the Iliad. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Mm. Even Jesus Christ, on the way to actually Calvary, he's stopped by what's called the Wailing Daughters of Jerusalem. So these were Jewish female keeners. Uh, and they, said to, they say to Christ, shall we keen for you? And he says, no, your kind of time is over. There's been this kind of hostility mm. between Christianity and the right of the pagan origins of the wake ever since. Mm. But um, it's such a kind of powerful uh, tool, this catharsis. I wonder, have you, in your life, you know, as, have you seen experience keening? In Ireland, or what was it like in, in Lithuania? Back in the, in, the in the late seventies, yeah, I would have seen it. Where okay. we would have, and that's when we started off in the old traditional way with the pub and the shop, and yeah. you know, we supplied more food than we did. There was more money out of that than there was actually in the coffin. Yeah, you know. And, and what was the Keenan like then, David? It was, it, it was something similar. I, I found it very strange myself at the time. Like, why would you sit around the coffin and start? Uh, uh, mumbling something that nobody could understand. There's no words attached to it. It's just like mm. it's just like a note that's gone out there yeah. uh, at different waves. And I just thought, where is that coming from? But I know the family themselves felt the funeral wasn't right unless this was done. Okay. And that certain person was, was the person to go to in the village. That she was going to do the king. Right. You know? Fantastic. And it was all about getting her to do it that made the whole thing happy for them. They were happy then. Yeah. And they referred it to me as, she's getting a good send off. Yeah. Mary Jo's going to come here to do the king. Sure. So I said, right, okay. And I started saying, right, I'm after spending several hours preparing that woman and you're telling me the keener is more yeah. <laughs> appreciated than I am. So I just thought the the stuff they see is more important to them than the stuff 
they don't see, even though they knew they had to do it. You but know. you see, the tradition of keening, the, mm. there's a description of a wake, one of the oldest descriptions in mm. Ireland, mm. goes back to 1689 in Galway. Mm. And it's by an English bookseller, a man called John Dunton. Mm. And his, uh, his landlord for the night, uh, his mother dies. And what they do is they, they take her bedding, they throw it out into the, the street and they set it on fire. And then he says they get prepared for this big, huge kind of um, wake. And the first thing he says is he, see, he sees 20 women uh, knocking back whiskey, Ushka Betha, and uh, he says the, the, the hooting women, and they're getting fired up for it. Mm. And, um, you know, in other places in the world, you can still hire, places like Ghana, you can still hire keeners today. That's right, yeah. You know, mm. and I hope, you know, for my uh, very, very delayed wake and funeral in time to come, I'll, I'll be hiring keeners. And, and I think, why not? Why not have... Um, a kind of ceremony. If you're, if you're going to go out and buy a big casket, or I was talking to someone today about how rich people in England are sort of building mausoleums and they're mm -hmm. spending a lot of money on funerals. Why not do the same? You know, why not hire, you'd hire musicians? Why not hire keeners? Why do we, we've kind of lost that tradition, but I think it's a tradition we should bring back. I don't know. I don't know Have we lost it. We just moved on to another thing. Like we had trad musicians playing today at the funeral. Oh, right. We, yeah. And that's still getting very popular. At the graveside or actually in the both, house? Both. Both, yeah. yeah, at both sides. Yeah. And uh, that's, and especially in, in the period now where COVID, because we're not getting this, we're trying to get it as much as we could yeah. of, of anything to make it a good funeral. Yeah. You know, everything has to be done to have it a good, a good funeral. Right. And, and how many musicians? Can you talk a little bit about what was it like? Haven't seen these trad musicians. I even see them regularly. Like. I see them regularly. Re yeah. We see them regularly. We had one in the funeral home there recently, and there was only 25 people allowed, but there was a full orchestra in there. Wow. There was a full. And then there, six weeks ago, we had a brass band playing at the cemetery. Okay. And uh, last week we had two pipers walking in front of the coffin. You know, yeah. Has to be piped into the grave. Right. He liked it. Yeah. So anything that the deceased liked made the family happy and helped them through that most difficult time in their life get through it. If he liked it, the man that's been, it's all about the person that's passed on. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you think about the, because obviously you, you have got that for the, the wishes of the, the deceased, mm. but the effect that that has on the mourners of having music, of having, and celebrating. It, yeah, but it's all about the deceased. Yeah. It's what they liked. Right. They will put up, it'll help them from a psychological point of view. The person that has passed on is being carried into the cemetery, being piped in by their favourite person or their yeah. favourite type of music. And it's just that comforting. Yeah. It's all about comforting families. And it's very simple when you think about it. It's comforting. Mm. They want to see the person laid out comfortably. And you know, when somebody passes on, it's the worst thing, as I said, that can happen to family or any human being will ever experience. If it's untimely, it's so hard to get any sort of normality back into your house. Yeah. You know, if you lose a kid, families that lose a kid, my heart goes out to them. And, like, it takes them... That, like, and the other thing I'll, I get to know, you'll hear people come up, oh, you, you know, you'll get over it, time will come. You don't get over the biggest loss ever, ever you you learn to live with it, yeah. but you never get over the loss. Yeah. So we have to circle the wagons. We have to give them everything that we possibly can to make the whole experience comfortable, to help them down the road, to mm. get normality back into their lives, get normality back into the house. From yeah. a psychological point of view, it's so important. Yeah. And at the same time, it is, I believe, should, given back to the person that has passed on. It's all about dignity with me. It's given that person, as they used to say to me, a good funeral. Yeah. And that's what I refer to as a good funeral. One to do across the pond. We, they used to write books and make jokes about our wake and all the amount of time we spend on the, you know, all that. And I've read a couple of books on psychologists years ago. And I was going like, where are they getting this? They're making fun of our wake. They're making fun. 
Well, I've gone back over and back to America, and I've started talking about where, where, how important and therapeutic it is to yeah. spend time with the deceased, like what sure. me and you just discussed. And it's, I'm watching now the psychologists, that they're starting to change the language a bit. Now sure. they're asking, why do the Irish grieve better than anybody else in the world? Yeah. The way. Yeah, I, I, it is, ultimately, it's not just a, a, an Irish wake, because the wake exists in lots and lots of human sort of cultures, and you can see it obviously in classic uh, literature, antiquity. Um, it is ultimately this gathering together of mortals in the company of the dead to comfort the bereaved. But also what you're talking about, these obligations, it's what he wanted, he wanted to be piped in. It's the sense that you, you're respecting the remains, the body of the dead, the wishes of the dead, that they are not just this, you know, you've, you've died and you've gone and that's it. And that's what I find difficult. I mean, that's why I write so much against the kind of English way of death, where you, you're in hospital, uh, you, your relatives see you in hospital and then you die and then boom, you're off. And then it's some time before there's ever actually physical contact again. Often, you know, literally you're, in the, you're sitting in the seat of the South London crematorium and there's a box going down four weeks later on and that's it. And there's not, um, you can obviously talk about, you know, what they wanted, but there's, it, it lacks uh, a humanity. It lacks a sort of tactile sense. The, the very fact that you never see this person. When I was talking about this moment of this encounter between the living and the dead, it's looking at that dead person and thinking, my God, they once were this existential shock that they are no longer alive. And that really, I think, is one of the most important encounters, encounters in human life because from that, you know, this, the, uh, the hunt for eternal life, you know, the, the people that they must be a religion, we must somehow, that their spirit is not gone. I, I'm, I'm a disagreeing with you on the old passing. <laughs> you know, I, I love to say dead. Mm -hmm. But obviously so many people, so many religious people mm. say, you know, believe, I was in a taxi in Boston earlier this year, and um, he was originally from uh, Haiti, and he was just talking about what's going to happen to him and the wife in heaven. You know, and it was important to him, and I absolutely sort of respect that. But it's that, um, you, you know, belief that you, I can see in the moment of encounter with death, you say, no, there must be something else. There must be another thing. And so we've had religions, and we've had, you know, we've had wars, and priesthoods and temples and synagogues. And then actually hundreds of millions of other people have been killed because they don't agree with our version of God. <laughs> and obviously the only point in having a God is because there's eternal life. Mm. So it all comes back to that moment of me, that you or you, the living person, looking at someone that you've loved, whose life has gone, whose what we think their spirit has gone. And that somehow the belief that we can save them, that, they, that there will be an afterlife, that we will be reunited. Mm. Um, and so it's a very, very powerful psychological, it's actually almost like a political human moment of, of human society. From this moment between the living and the dead spring so many cultures, so many religions. Mm. And without that, you know, you've, you've lost this huge bit of human history, a huge bit of understanding. <laughs> I don't know what you think of that, David. <laughs> well, you could... So you're, you're, you're closer to God, you're <laughs> even than a priest. No, a lot of the cultures... <laughs> look, I will not disagree. I'm a, I've, I've, one thing I learned in life is to listen to everybody mm. and listen to everybody's opinion. Yeah. Um, in my own opinion, and I wouldn't force this opinion on anybody, I'm just talking from experience. Most of the cultures that I talk to about death, yes, they didn't believe in a God, but they'd tell me they believe in something. So really, they were only telling me they believe in this, but they called him another thing. They didn't call him God. Right. It could be Mecca, it could be... Yeah, yeah. I was standing in, in a cemetery recently where I was engaged to look after a person that passed on yeah. from <laughs> the Muslim tradition. Sure, sure. And being in America, I would have known their traditions. And let me tell you, I respect everybody's mm. tradition for reasons. Yeah. But in the cemetery, there was the one that he has to face Mecca. Yeah. So as I was standing in the site, and in, this, in the cemetery anyway, and we came up with a conclusion that we'd be able to do it in that way, and I just said, yeah, looked at the compass. So 
Mecca would be to the east of where I was standing. Yeah. An old tradition in this country is you face the east. Yeah. yeah you yeah. face the rising sun. Um, yeah. Right? Waiting for so rapture. There's just a different name attached. Yeah. yeah. Now, so that's the belief and that's it. But of my 40 years in the business, there's one thing I tell you I believe in from what I've seen. The spiritual world is much greater than the one down here. Right. Okay? Because I've seen things happen at funerals that you just couldn't say were coincidence. Hmm. I left a coffin up against a wall the other day in a house. And the woman came out and she just put her two hands, no, no, it can't go there. I says, why? Because if the people come in here, it'll be in the way if we put it there. No, she hated that picture. All right. She hated that picture, but I just thought, so we were there and I said, if we put it over there. Anyway, we kind of agreed, but she wasn't happy. What happened after? The picture fell off the wall. The picture fell off the wall. So anyway, I said, look, that's... Sorry, did one of the lads hit against it mm. when they were taken off the lid? Did they touch it? Yeah. And uh, it didn't. But anyway, she said, that picture is there 30 years, hanging on that spot. And I've never come How up did it fall? <laughs> no. So, yeah. You can laugh about <laughs> I'm that. I'm not laughing. I'm you, not, you I have can to, laugh I, about I that one. I can completely but, but, respect but, but, those but things. But I do believe in it. And there's, that's one that you can sort of throw a bit of a smile, but there are more serious things I've seen happening as well. Yeah. I have told people that if they're ever in trouble, talk to the spirit. And I said, uh, a good place to talk is surround yourself with nature. I tell people, go to the waves, go to the sea, go to the forest. Sure. And I said, if you have ever a problem, most normal people have problems in their lives at some stage. Yeah. Right? They go through a disappointment or they just have to get something. And if I walk down any of the streets there, I get a tip on the shoulder and ask me, have I time for a coffee? No, I wouldn't, yeah. but I'd make time because I'd sure. know what was coming. You told me 12 months ago, I did have a situation. Yeah. I tried everything. It didn't work. I was putting two slices of bread in the toaster the other morning, and I just thought about what you said a year ago, and I did it, and that problem was solved. Yeah. Now, see, yeah. you told me, she said, talk to the spirit. Yeah. If you have a problem, a door or a path will open up in front of you that will solve that. Now, they won't make you win the lotto, but yeah. they will help in solving it. And I believe in that. I do believe during death, after somebody has passed on, I believe the spirit waits around for a while. Now, I do believe it moves on somewhere. I don't yeah. know where that is. But I've seen things happen in houses and symmetries and different things that happen. Yeah. I said to a corpse recently, Stop acting the maggot now. Yeah. I believe that they're... But you see, I, again, that, that is really interesting because, again, if you look back in the Iliad, there's, you know, it's, it's a common grief reaction to, to dream about your dead, to believe that the dead are kind of given messages and, um, you know, that you, you... And why wouldn't they? Because, of course, you have lived with someone all your life. Just because they've died, it doesn't mean to say that you stop loving them. In a kind of former life, when I was a, a sort of reporter, we used to go around the Middle East and we used to interview suicide bomber families. And we always had the dream question. We would ask the mum and dad, and usually their son had actually blown themselves up mm. and killed people. And we said, we would say to them, have, do you ever see them in your dreams? And the answer was always yes. Do you see them in their dreams? They say that they're in somewhere nice and green and lush. Janna, you know, Arabic for paradise. Yeah. And there's sort of this sense of communicating. And obviously, it's, it's not just about traumatic death. I mean, if it's very, very common grief reaction to communicate with this dead person, to feel that they are close. I think that's one of the important things about cemeteries is that, and a locus, you know, for the spirit of the dead person, mm. that you can go there and you feel closer to them, as opposed to, you know, just a little plaque. I don't want to keep on mentioning South London crematorium, but, mm. you know, you get a little kind of Timson plaque mm. and there's like 500 of them on the wall. And you think, no, no, you, you can't really communicate. But I think that, again, is very therapeutic to be able to feel that you're close to that person. Sometimes a physical place, 
But obviously, as you say, it could be at the toaster doing. Yeah, and the two key words is warm and comfort. Right. They're the two things that you get, that I feel that you get. Another insistent thing from talking to bereaved families and you ask, is it important to see the body and whatever? Most people that I have, ex from my experience, when they think about them, the person that has passed on, they always think, you'll always remember the last time you see them, mm. if you think about them. And that's pretty evidence out there from my experience. So that's why it's very important to make sure that when you do let them see them for the last time, they look comfortable. Mm. They look comfy. And that's why I went and left the pub in the shop and the gas and the wigs and went off to learn the process of embalming. Yeah. Because I knew it was very, very important to that family. Prior to that, I would have been involved in rural funerals. I remember one funeral we went and we had to take the coffin outside of the house and leave it outside on the footpath for the comfort of the people going through the building. And loads of disturbances like that. Mm. I knew if I had to keep this tradition going, I had to find a way to do this and solve this problem to protect our culture, ritual and traditions. And I came back then and I started sharing that knowledge with everybody. I didn't keep it to myself. So we set up a school in 1995 and we've trained over 130 people around this island now. Mm. I've gone on to the islands and where it was impossible for the people. I've worked with them for weeks and weekends and I got great, I got great ther therapy from going out, mixing with that culture, just sitting back and watching them, how they adapted to the death and the loss and how the grieving families and every parish was different. Sure. It was always a little, little change. Yeah. See, but they were proud of the change. Yeah. Pride. Yeah. That's the word there. I remember when my grandfather's mm. funeral back in 1979 mm. in Eccles, and we had like almost a, a holy man in the village. And then we did with the chairs. So when he came out, uh, it was a howling November night, absolutely lashing down. And we sort of took him out and we put him on the chairs. And then there's a holy man with a the bottle of holy water in a lemonade bottle. And he was not only just splashing on the chairs, uh, but splashing against the side of the house, even though the water was running down the house. Mm. And that was obviously a kind of anthropologist who call it a rite of reversal, so that the spirit of the dead person would never be able to cross the barrier into the house and never sit in the chairs. But I wonder, are there other things in this fantastic county of Mayo, other little traditions, David, that you've come across? That well, funny enough, when I was studying the Mayo, and is it still exists in where it was? Funny enough, I looked at all different counties, and uh, Mio was the strongest. Mm. Yeah, that came out of the research yeah. uh, that I did. And uh, but there would be <laughs> there would be there would be little differences, and they'd be so important to the family. So when I'm training a funeral director, I'd say now a family might say something to you that you think is completely off the yeah. radar, but it's very important to them. Yeah, yeah. It's very important that we go way up the mountain and stop outside that holy well for, for, for one minute before we bring them to the final resting place. Yeah, yeah. It's a tradition in this parish that the heiress has to go up there, but the road is little, so narrow that only one vehicle up, so the family has to stop down at the end of the road, let the heiress the way up, do the stop, come back down. Yeah. Everybody's happy. He went there for the last time. Yeah. I remember once going to this wake in Belfast because it's interesting, some places along the border and actually up north, the wake is very, very strong. And I went to this wake in Belfast and he was a kind of a bit of a gangster. And, uh, and it, we, we were a bit early. We were, we were actually trying to do a last minute interview, <laughs> but, but he was so close to death, the interview was gone. But um, it, was like, it was like going back to Troy. There were lots of uh, young women with kind of acrylic nails on their iPhones. The room was absolutely packed, <laughs> absolutely packed, waiting for him to die, just waiting for him to die. Like, it was really, really old-fashioned. You, you could have looked it out some, some 18th century book, and the house was full of women. And then there was another house, a separate house, that was full of men. And they were all there. They had this uh, West Belfast kind of patois where you can barely understand what they're saying because <laughs> they're speaking so fast. But 
it, was, it really struck me that this, even in an urban uh, setting, that you can still get these very, very old traditions. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you asked me there for a few. I was just, I could tell you several. It's in one part of the parish, the spouse has to travel in the hearse with you. Oh, right. To the, to the cemetery that it yeah. took a man or thing. And if you came to the village without that in the hearse, it'd be looked upon as a disgrace. Okay. He or she wouldn't sit in the hearse with yeah. his wife. So that wouldn't apply in other but there would be another area then that you don't, in another parish, then you wouldn't open a grave on a Monday because it'd be opened in 12 months again if you do. Right. So whenever oh, we... Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we did have a burial on a Tuesday where the grave had to be opened on the Monday, yeah. we would make sure there's a sod taken off it on the Sunday. Yeah. Oh, you, that's the word they use, a sod. Take the sod off. So you put the shovel in the ground, it. uh, it's okay. open then. Yeah. But you won't get in that parish, you, you know, it'd be disgraceful. Yeah. It'd be, oh. Are you be, young enough to remember clay pipes or tobacco or Yeah, snuff? I got some clay pipes up in Ruski. That's where the factory was making yeah. them at the time. And I brought them to, the, to America to explain the wake yeah. as a visual aid. Yeah. And um, uh, they couldn't... Um, grasp it at all why would you bring a p clay pipe you know yeah but uh, you would explain to them afterwards like that's the you know people was given that as a gift for in return for coming to our wake yeah and uh you could one of the old i'm uh, speaking to an old uh, undertaker family of undertakers mm -hmm. in Ackle. Uh, his father one of the one of the first things on the funeral order was a gross of clay pipes. Yeah, yeah. There was a big pot of jam, a right, couple yeah. of bottles of whiskey, but bread. You talk about traditions in rural. This morning I was doing the funeral, and uh, it's customary in that place. Everybody, all the mourners, take off their ties and they throw them into the grave. Oh, really? Yeah, and that was done this morning. My daughter was with me, and she's in train. She said, Dad, I've never seen that before. Right. And uh, so everybody took off the tie and put the tie into the grave. Into the yeah. grave? Yeah, into the coffin, yeah. And then... There's a tip. Huh? There's a tip. <laughs> I said, someone once said to me, the undertakers tell you to take off their wedding ring because of your hand, before COVID, your hand would be shaken so much that it would kind of bruise. That's right. We, we would always advise people. like, if we, But again, you judge the funeral. You know, if the person was young and you were going to, I'm talking about 2,000 people here. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've had funerals in that funeral home where there was 5,000 people. Wow. When my colleagues come over from England to look at what we do over here, they're just astonished yeah. that the amount of people will come out. Yeah. So then I looked at them and I said, now isn't it very important to prepare them properly? There's 5,000 people going through there looking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And to you'd me... You'd be a pop star in England. Hmm? Not, you'd be like a pop star in England to get 5,000 people. Not that they would have a laying out in England, but in order to get that many people... At a funeral in England, you have to be... Yeah, I, you know. I'm a, I know a lot, I have a lot of colleagues in the UK and we share knowledge and they're interested in what I'm doing over here and they're in, interested in our whole cultural ritual and tradition associated with death. And so is every other country, by the way, as well. Mm. Uh, they're envious of us. Um, and they know, and we'll go back to the board we started here, we do death well. Mm. But the English lads and girls... They look at our culture and they're saying, why would you want 3,000 people? At the then you explain the whole therapeutic reason. Yeah. And then I'd say to them, like, why are you learning to embalm if you don't take any pride in, or min you, in maintaining the dignity of the deceased? Like? And you get a conversation going and eventually they start to come around, eventually. Yeah. But in fairness to the people in England, a lot to do with the, the, the viewing is because... It's two weeks before they normally get the deceased. Now, yeah. if you told me somebody is passed on there two weeks ago, I'd be going, this is a closed coffin. Yeah. How am I going yeah. to show? So in fairness to the industry, it's a lot to do with the administration, where like on a Friday evening at four o'clock, every funeral home shuts down, yeah. and you do nothing till Monday morning. Yeah. Then you have to contact the coroner, could take three days to that. There's a whole seven days doing paperwork. Sure. Right? Um, so but that's a system that's sort of evolved. That's really where death has been taken out of the hands of families. Correct. And, and, and it's bureaucracy that rules. Yeah. And it's not, it's not, I'm not saying anyone's, it's not malevolent, but it's just the machine. I, mm. I call it like the Western death machine, is that it, it basically anonymizes us and grinds us up. 
and you forget really at the center of it all is one dead person and their family and th their needs should be uppermost rather than just yeah, subjugated by this yeah machine. and it's important to maintain our tradition ritual and cultures and this is why the COVID 19 i'm very scary about it because it could affect our traditions and rituals. Mm. it has done will the people return to what we're used to i think they will i think they will. i wouldn't i'd i'd park that decision yeah. or thought for a minute but what happened here in the states the reason they brought me over it wasn't just that i was somebody that came out of the book but they were listening to some of the stuff i was saying the whole industry in the states in the in 2006 the funeral industry was collapsing everybody was turning to cremation right now in america i worked there as well as part of my training the profit in a funeral was in the casket yeah you know you buy your casket for 500 dollars and they were selling it for three or four thousand dollars you know yeah so now if you're cremating somebody you don't need a big expensive casket like California now has gone 80% cremation. Now the funeral industry is here because they were so reliant on the high profit margin of cancer. It's collapsed. Yeah. So when I went back on the stage, they asked me what did I think the reasons was. And I says, you took the culture, ritual and tradition. Mm. You brought in rules that didn't allow you to carry coffins. You brought in rules that you couldn't take the body home. Yeah. You top brought in rules that you can't even see the coffin going down the street. You have to put curtains in case you distract somebody. So basically, what you did with your rules and regulations, you went, no, 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 no. So yeah. the public decided, well, if I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that, we may as well take them away and cremate them. Yeah. Then I would refer to them, and I'd say, finally, it's amazing, you had it, and you lost it. Yeah. And then I would explain about the 22 million people that landed on their island that brought these traditions with them, put their holy middles in the ground. Now, I was a little bit in the European Association when we went, joined Europe. There was rules and regulations starting to come out and filter out. And it could affect our traditions in relation to funerals. They were looking at, you can't let the mehel dig a grave. You can't let people under health and safety carry coffins. Sure. I came screaming out for that. We need to hold on to those important things yeah. or we'll end up like America. Sure. Tradition, ritual and cultures. It sounds like a good moment. I think we're at the end of our time. And I, I said I'd do a little bit of bardic poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if that's appropriate. Um, so it's a little poem uh, that's inspired by Ackle Island and uh, a bit inspired by the uh, Iliad and it's called If I Could Sing. <coughs> if I could sing, I would not sing of the fallen city of Ilias and glories gone or Hector's blood dried and stained in sand beneath that wretched ski and gate nor plagues, nor wars, nor all the ravage and the loss. No, if I could sing, I would sing of my mother's island far out to the west, rising sea plucked, spray lashed, this citadel of stone walled deep in the blue ocean, this other Troy, this Irish Troy, closer to the sinking sun, unconquered. If you could hear my song, you too would listen in rapture to the Imro Kinsha, crying out, heart struck still for Hector and his children sundered in the same grieving that the living and the dead must commingle in the sickening, the dying and the grave. Ancient and new and eternal chorus, mourners, keeners, pilgrims at the wake, bound to ensure belief that in this unselfish giving to the dead, that newborn sons and daughters will spring from the pulsating wombs of the lamenting living. Now if I could sing, I would not sing of glories gone and the lost city of Ilias, but of this island, my mother's island, far out to the west, rising, sea pluck spray lashed, that citadel of stone where the last best hope of humanity beats on, that mortal being incarnate in flesh shall not live, love, or die alone. And if I could sing, if we could sing together, my brothers and sisters, surely then we should never stop the singing of this song. 
the fitting end to a fantastic feast of food for thought. Uh, thank you so much to Kevin and David for their fascinating and insightful conversation. Don't forget, Ballina Fringe Festival in association with the Ice House continues to the end of this week. Full details of the remaining events can be found on our website, ballinafringefestival.ie. We also have a GoFundMe campaign running at the moment, and any contribution that you would like to uh, donate to us would be gratefully received. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks to Ray Ford and EAV for handling protect production duties, and uh, thank you for watching, and good night.